Thank you. Uh, my name is Timur Yurokov. I'm a, a neurosurgery spine uh, specialist at the University of Miami. It is an absolute pleasure to be here alongside such an amazing faculty. I see the slides going, perfect. Uh, a lot already has been said today about the lateral and oblique approaches to the lumbar spine. Uh, and it's great to see so many open-minded people willing to go outside of the normal, comfortable zone and explore these uh, approaches. So let me continue with some of the points and hopefully we'll keep driving in the idea of the importance of knowing how to access pretty much at any angle the lumbar spine. Quick disclosures. Uh, in terms of minimally invasive, right, what does that mean to everybody? And it's not just about the skin incision. I hope everyone realizes any surgical procedure involves multiple systems and how we um, affect them, affect the overall outcome on the patient. It's not just the incision, again, it's about amount of destruction or uh, changes in the structural uh, components of the spine that we're doing, and also time. Time is a major component. The time of operation, the downtime of post-operative recovery period, all of that has to be taken into account how minimally invasive we were with the uh, surgical approach. Let's take this kind of a, a basic premise. Degenerative disc disease is the root of all evil. All right, as the uh, age progresses, the iridiparal disc height slowly deteriorates. The anterior column loses its overall height or length. Uh, and as a result, you get the flat back, loss of lordosis, and all of the associated pathologies down the line. We know the importance of the lumbar lordosis had been reiterated so many times with the original Schwab classification and the addition from the uh, SRS Society. By now, no one questions that. We all know we need to match the PI with lumbar lordosis. Um, the SVA is important, so talk is not about this. I think this is a well accepted um, concept at this point. It's how we do the correction, how we achieve the favorable lordosis that we still discuss a lot. Traditionally, doing posterior osteotomies, removing the facet joints, and cranking on the spine um, allows you to restore some of the lordosis. And the point of articulation then becomes the posterior corner of the vertebral body. So that's what we're pivoting against. And of course, gravity being prone becomes important because a lot of times when you talk about lateral, people say, well, in lateral you don't really get that gravitational force, you don't get the full benefit of lordosis. Yes, for this technique you have to be in prone, it helps you when you remove the piece of bone and you want to crank on them. Of course, realizing that placing an inner body spacer, either a T-lift or a lateral, <laughs> allows you to achieve uh, even, even higher grade of uh, angulation together with osteotomies, like in this case, maybe a little bit too much, but the point is proven. It is a really powerful technique, whether you do that single segment or multiple segments. Uh, and once you place something in the uh, intervertebral space, the pivoting point starts to shift forward. It becomes more anterior. But you're still relying on the closure of the posterior element. So again, maybe prone positioning is more preferred. And the actual choice for intervertebral disc graft, of course, is up to you. Many discussions, we talked about T-lifts today, why people love them. The T-lift has been the workhorse of minimal invasive spine surgery. And of course, I could have made an equal slide for a bad lateral case, right? But the associated issue with T-lifts being a small graft size, the approach, um, the migration, the subsidence, I just felt like maybe doing the lateral cage or leaning towards it kind of alleviates a lot of that, in my practice at least. And so uh, that's how I turned into uh, coming more and more from the site and trying to get the larger footprint, larger craft, getting a lateral inner body um, approach as much as possible. And in this situation, when you do it with minimal invasive approach, the pivoting point now shifts back towards the facet. We're restoring the intervertebral disc height, probably getting the anatomy the closest it's, it's been when patient had been in their younger years. Do we really need that prone positioning for, to achieve the lordosis? I would argue not anymore. This is a very uh, common picture we know about different ways of getting to the disc space. And of course, uh, as uh, Dr. Anand already showed in his chart, in lateral you probably have the most access. Um, and that's what we're gonna concentrate on. Traditionally, when we taught direct lateral approach, and of course starting with Dr. Pimenta's work way early in 2000s, in my residency I was told you look at the crest, if the crest is about four or five, nah, it's gonna be difficult, you know, you can try to angle the bed, but if it's still about the four or five, 
you try to avoid that, right? And that preoperative decision making. And so uh, now the 4.5 is not accessible. Of course, now we're learning to do anterior to psoas oblique approaches that alleviate that whole idea of uh, considering the crest position. And also with the anterior to psoas, you don't even need to put the patient on the uh, cranked angled uh, bed anymore. The patient can stay neutral on the side. 4.5 and 5.1 are not really accessible with direct lateral, and uh, Dr. Anat made that point today, right? What do you do? You can do uh, all the beautiful X lift and laterals, one to five, and then what do you do at 5.1? Stage it, do an A lift, flip around. Nobody likes to flip, right, as was mentioned earlier. And so do you end up with just putting a T lift cage that looks like this? Well, the slide, of course, is not to demean the idea and technique, but it kind of feels a little bit of oxymoronic, right, when you're working with large graphs and everywhere else, and the most important space, the L5S1, gets that little T lift. And here you have a comparison of a banana cage versus a lateral cage. So hopefully, point well understood. And just a quick slide, some fixes, just from the beginning, you look at it and you know, they're not gonna work, something's gonna break, right? As in this case, that same cage just pops out. So hopefully by now, with all the presentations prior and a couple of slides that I've shown, it becomes maybe more acceptable, apparent, the real power of having the complete ability to approach lumbar sacral region through the oblique, lateral, versatile way. And just, to, you know, a little bit of a humor, right? Direct lateral by now, with all the works of the big guys and the years, now becomes like a, riding a tricycle. It's simple, people know what to do, complications are well aware. ATP, something that's novel, you know, not as hard, requires some adjustments. And of course, coming to 5-1, and we've touched on it today, do it by, yourself, having a pro surgeon, it becomes more of a uh, kind of an advanced technique that needs to be further explored. Having that unrestricted access to anterior column gives you so much power with what you can do with spine. Great cases uh, by Dr. Pham already demonstrating that. Uh, here are just some of the um, uh, incision consi uh, consideration. Smaller approaches because you not you don't really need that shark bite incision uh, to different areas and I usually prefer to make them along the same hypothetical dermatomal line so the pain is really supplied by the same uh, neurological I guess uh, components uh, in this particular case as you can see I've noted the M&M &M, right painless right quadricep weakness after the surgery it was nothing really during the surgery that would direct towards me again new approach new complications have to be aware of it <laughs> I track all my cases prospectively, so I know I don't lose anything out, everything's recorded, and I can look back and try to analyze what, did, what went wrong and what do we do about it. In this particular case, you see the uh, 5-1 was in the lateral A-lift, which is another consideration. Do you do a lateral A-lift where you just expose inner, um, vascular space and pretend this is just A-lift in the lateral? Or as I'll show you later, I have uh, um, became a fan of articulating cages within the 5-1 space as well. Incision planning, traditional A-lift is usually done through the uh, uh, rectus sheath across the, uh, you know, the abdominus rectus muscle. With the oblique approaches, we're more in the obliques, and when you require multiple access point, going through the aponeurosis line becomes very powerful as well because even less distraction happens, but the closure, I've noticed, becomes a little more trickier in terms of trying to get that wall together again if you had made the cut on the offsite from the, um, from the, uh, the cartilage. So uh, just to summarize quickly, for the lateral approaches, we already talked about it. A lot of advantages we do uh, restoration of lordosis, large area of the implant itself, dissipation of forces, subsidence, uh, more volume for graft, uh, that help, hopefully helps with fusion, uh, reduced tissue dissection, so that's more going towards the post-operative recovery, how much pain patient has, uh, the hospital stay, less blood loss, uh, again, not manipulating paraspinal structures, the benefit of indirect decompression has been shown already, and all of that hopefully leads to decreased hospital stay, improved recovery, better outcomes, better patient satisfaction. But keep in mind all the pitfalls again. Uh, new approaches, new anatomical structures to be aware of. Of course, we talked about lumbar plexus versus, and, and talking about direct versus anterior to psoas, how it all can be avoided in terms of complication. But now we're in a completely different zone. You know, We're used to doing prone procedures where it's just spine, muscle, bone, and nerve, and we're comfortable. And now we're converting into an all-around uh, full body, and there's a real person in front of us with all these other structures that can be damaged. 
coming at any oblique angle. Now we're deviating from that direct vertical or direct linear axis, and that can stray us in the direction that, you know, whatever the oblique uh, approach shows. And pretty much everything's at risk that we're coming through. The peritoneum, the psoas itself, it's very common to end up on the dorsal edge of the psoas initially when you start doing these oblique dissections. The sympathetic chains, vessels, um, the spinal canal itself, putting the cage that you're not angulating enough and then thinking that you're in line with the disc but you're oblique and all of a sudden you end up either in the foramen on the other side or the canal. Uh, I've experimented a lot. As you can see, this is a very uh, industry agnostic presentation. Pretty much every single company is represented here for the retractor that I've tried to use and optimize in my approaches. I found uh, something that keeps the bulk of the retractor away from the incision with radiolucent blades. Uh, and of course, the versatility with the blades themselves helps a lot with these approaches. And as, you, as I've now been doing more and more, I realized anatomy is not always the same. Of course, simple realization, right? But it's an uh, unpractical kind of approach. You start doing, you think a uh, patient's super skinny, it's gonna be a chip shot, you get in there, and you can see the vessels are just not amenable to opening up in that 5-1 space. In this particular case, you can see the um, uh, left common iliac vein is traversing right across the disc space and was not really mobile, so I elected to go between the artery and the vein. So having that versatility again helps. And I've used the articulating cage, which I've mentioned earlier. Uh, an advantage to a lateral a lift an articulating cage in this uh, case specifically allows you to have a smaller window of access. You don't need to expose as much. You don't need to have that full left to right um, annular um, uh, approach. A small window performing the discectomy distraction allows to open up the space and place a still pretty large graft within the disc space, maintaining all of the benefits of that approach. High sacral slope, uh, traditional a lift access may be difficult at that pubic symphysis and in a way having angled instruments, like in this case uh, with a high sacral slope patient, still allows you to access and perform the adequate decompression, height restoration, and graft placement. So now I've shown that really the uh, access to the full lumbar sacral spine is important if you want to achieve, if you want to, as Dr. Pimenta said, if you only do the top two levels, you're not a lateral surgeon. Of course, it's a very dogmatic sentence, but it, there is benefit to lateral approach, and we want to maintain that benefit across all levels. Otherwise, this, the spine construct is going to be as strong at its weakest point, right? Uh, coming on to next, right? So now let's say you're comfortable with doing laterals. But the time for surgery is still long. Do you stage it over several days? Do you just toughen it out and do a 10-hour procedure? Or can we combine the stages, which has been mentioned already today, for the single stage, simultaneous uh, kind of a surgery being performed? And it's just a quick blocks demonstrating, right, that flip. You eliminate the flip, and further, you can overlap the two steps. On the pictures, you can see how uh, the teams are working pretty much. You can see on the bottom right, there's a direct lateral, an oblique to five one, and the screws being placed all at the same time. Um, hopefully saving a lot of time. And time is important, especially nowadays, right, with all the uh, staffing issues, OR space issues, now uh, the crackdown on the double rooms. It's going to get tougher and tougher to perform bigger surgeries because you have a line of patients that need to be operated on. So do you do a 10-hour surgery or three three-hour surgeries, right? It makes a difference. Uh, I trained at University of Miami. I did my infolded fellowship at University of Miami with Dr. Wang, Dr. Levy, Dr. Green. So I am as inbred as it gets with spine surgery, right? And I started as faculty at University of Miami three years ago. Coming in, I had never seen a single stage surgery done or performed, but I felt like this is what we need to be doing. So I had to develop it slowly. And of course, I had a lot of support from my uh, senior faculty, even though they have never done it. But I was very grateful that they were able to allow me to push for it. I started simple, single level um, procedure that, you know, usually that. <laughs> It's not a problem, lateral position or t lift. Uh, any of those surgeries would have been okay for the surgery. And we've placed lateral screws in lateral, uh, screws in lateral um, by using fluoroscopy initially. And that just proved that having that extra bulk of equipment gets in the way. You have to fight between the screwdriver handles, you can see on the bottom left picture, an actual line of sight, you're not looking at the patient. Doable, but cumbersome. For the next, 
kind of a period where, like, okay, so how can we make that better? And that's when we start using the navigation techniques, and that made things easier. We can see the anatomy better. Uh, as long as you set up the navigation properly, put all the right steps before you start operating, uh, it, the system should work. And it's always the humans that make the mistakes, right? The machines work. The machines do what they're programmed to do. So it, it is important to keep all those preliminary steps in order. And I like Dr. Pham's notes about soft touch, right? You don't want to change things a lot too much. But doing the uh, navigated now allows me to uh, um, kind of come on the other side, do the interior to source approach as my residents can follow the navigated trajectories. So we did that for a while, but then again, something's not right. Using the navigation in lateral, yes, doable, but requires a lot of still sweating, a lot of work. Uh, what, what else can be done? And that line of sight is a way, uh, which was bothering me the whole time. So the next phase, we were using heads-up display with augmented reality, overlaid images, to be able to see the anatomy at the same time as you put the screws. You're in lateral. You're already off by 90 degrees. Your hand-eye coordination is completely different. And you know, having turning your head all the time back and forth kind of confuses you even more. In the academic environment where residents switch, the rotations come on a monthly, every other four month, whatever, the level of uh, skill changes all the time. So how can we make that more uniform? So we tried to do that and made things a lot easier. But still, using the navigation system, you still rely on the technique, on the skill of whoever's doing that particular uh, instrumentation. There's variability. And then you can see on the post up, you know, uh, uh, Patient did well and slowly recovered. It was a long recovery. The 5-1, at that time, I was still avoiding doing 5-1. I was not comfortable. It took me some time to get comfortable. Um, but eventually, that's how we got to a robotic phase, right? We've learned, OK, we're using navigation, even though with the heads-up display, we don't have to look away. But still, a new patient, a new person comes in, starts putting the screws in, and they bump something, they get off. And it's like learning curve every time. Bringing the robot in allows you to even further level out the playing field. Uh, let's see. You can see on the bottom, uh, on, on the left, as I'm doing my exposure, a PGY-5. Uh, they had just come on the rotation, able to follow the robotic arm. And now that screw placement, while still requiring a lot of consideration and taking care of, of the positioning and structures, becomes much more streamlined. And just a little more pictures. And uh, we use Excelsius in our practice. You can see it's a little bit different. We saw Mazor systems earlier. They all do the same thing. They allow you to follow the predetermined trajectory and hopefully stay within it, not deviate. So now with the uh, robot in place, I feel at ease. I, I can slowly concentrate on uh, doing the exposure at whatever levels we're looking at uh, while the screws are being done. And the workflow, usually, we position the patient, place the navigation array, do the O-arm spin, and start the robotics part with screws starting from the top level towards uh, the pelvis where the array is. And as the screws are being done, I perform the exposures. At, if I have two incisions or three incisions, I just get down to the spine and, and leave a, a lap in there without mobilizing anything. Once the screws are done, x-ray comes in, and now we can perform discectomies and placement of the cages. So um, as of now, uh, all of these cases are being prospectively collected. And of course, it's ongoing, and we need to have longer data for the um, uh, better outcome measures and more of a uh, data on adjacent level disease, proximal junctional kyphosis, whether or not that original hypothesis that restoring the anterior column height only without doing osteotomies brings patient's anatomy closer to their original alignment uh, and therefore alleviates the added forces that sometimes we add with surgery by hyperlar dosing or underlar dosing. And hopefully, we'll see. We'll see in the future if that will be the case. So far, 33 cases collected, 77 total levels, and 20 of them at 5'1". 186 pedicle screws in a lateral position, with three of them Obviously, that once we do the x-ray, like, no, we got to change that. And we would exchange it right away, even though no neuromonitoring changes and no neurologic sequelae were noted. Of course, the breach analysis is going to be completely different. It's not going to be three out of 186. There's going to be a lot more uh, screws that are breached, like at the top right picture. You can see the top screw is definitely having a superior breach. But some of it is acceptable, I think. If the purchase is good, I think going after it and trying to make it look perfect for the x-ray may actually compromise uh, the actual contract. 
Complication, and I think this is the most important part. Uh, I think it's uh, in a way dangerous when someone starts quoting a low complication rates from meta-analysis, 1%, 0.8%. People coming in feel like, oh, it's a safe procedure to do, and then you start doing the surgeries, you get at the 30% complication rate. Are you a bad surgeon? Is this a learning curve? We, you know, when, what do you do about it, right? Two choices, you can continue getting better, or three choices, I guess. Continue getting better, reduce the complication rate. You can um, stop doing the procedure because you're just like, oh my god, everybody has a 1% and I have 30, probably I shouldn't be doing it. Or you, know, you can under-report, probably, which is what happens a lot of time, right? So you have to take all these numbers with a grain of salt. As you can see in the complication here, uh, so far, four venous injury uh, during the surgery where venous blood starts pulling, and all of them were controlled with just pressure with uh, fibrillar and not requiring any uh, major reconstruction. In one case, I had to abandon placing a cage because uh, I felt like I couldn't get a good control without pressure, so I just let it sit, and once it was all stable, not bleeding anymore, I exited. Um, one post-op cystic collection, which uh, originally I thought maybe it was a hematoma, but then getting in, it was a bright yellow fluid, which I sent together with the UA. Slight difference in numbers, not completely together as if you know we had a ureteral active injury, but the color of that fluid was very suspicious for that. We had urology on board, they, we did all the studies, could not really find that ureteral injury, but I feel like it was probably maybe something that was transient, collected, and then occluded, and we were dealing with it. So a real uh, uh, something consideration. Uh, ipsilateral leg swelling, right? I've had one in this series of 33 cases. I think there's a different series that we have where we use a single stage lateral with plates, and I feel like in those cases, there's a lot more patients coming in with that uh, ipsilateral leg swelling, probably related to sympathetics which uh, remains to be further determined. And also interesting ones, uh, the approaches are left-sided, but I've had several patients that come up and wake up with the right-sided um, uh, or neurological symptom. In one case that was shown earlier, quadricep weakness with no neurological, with no uh, neuromonitoric changes. Uh, one right foot drop, which I believe probably was from the oblique angulation of the cage and trying to get too aggressive on the contralateral annulus. Uh, and then three patients that are Surgery went well, no indication of any problems. They wake up and they say they have intractable pain on the right side along the L5 distribution. All three had the L5S1 done in an oblique fashion. And again, I think this is where a DRG sensitivity comes into place, probably being too aggressive, uh, maybe as a root malleting or even passing the instruments to the other side. So far, recording and thinking about it and trying to reflect on it, right? We'll see what the total numbers, how they look, but they're, the complication, I believe, are always the most important part of any new approach that we're trying to teach to others and trying to make it more popularized. So in conclusion, uh, as I believe, anterior column height restoration in itself allows for a lot of good MIS techniques and good um, biomechanical outcomes on the patient. Lateral and oblique approaches, uh, theoretically, right, provide the low morbidity axis being the only thing that's cut the skin, as we've mentioned, right? Going intramuscular between the muscle fibers, not really cutting anything else allows you to have that lower morbidity. That's granted if nothing else happens. And knowing all levels, being able to access all levels in the lateral is important to really benefit from the full power of lateral and oblique approaches. Of course, screws in lateral, been shown multiple times it's feasible. Robotics make it easier, as I've shown it too. And keeping that in mind, hopefully over time, as the technique gets better, the invasiveness, the total invasiveness, depending on the time, the amount of exposure needed, and what's done to the patient will keep getting better and better and better. My email is at the bottom, looking for collaborators, multi-center studies, please reach out, we'll work on it together, make it better. Thank you. <laughs> uh, great talk, Timur, and I, I think a very, um, actually, I, I think an honest representation of your experience with uh, single position lateral. I, I, I think um, one of the uh, problems with a lot of these presentations that we give, I'll stay right here, Timur, is I, I think we try to, you know, give optimal results. You know, we're trying to drive home a point that uh, procedure has uh, its advantages, but we, we kind of shy away from disadvantages. Uh, on the last one, we saw the... Uh, AOL um, uh, uh, injury kind of problem. And I think uh, in this uh, presentation, uh, he, he gave a really good sort of, uh, and I think a realistic 
um, illustration of the potential complications of single position surgery, particularly at L5S1. Um, I um, have also uh, done procedures uh, laterally at 5.1, and I find it challenging. I, I think it's not as easy as people uh, outline, and there's definitely some pros and cons to it. Uh, the vascular issue is uh, a big one, uh, particularly if you're doing your own approach. And um, I understand, Tim, are you do your own approach? Okay. Yes, yeah, I my own. Yeah, so I, I think um, I, it's, it's an area where if you have a vascular problem, it could be uh, potentially life-threatening. And uh, so I wanted to ask you about these vascular uh, bleeding issues. Uh, did it come from retraction uh, when you were putting your instrumentations in and out? And I know you addressed it with just pressure, but what would have happened if it was more pronounced than that? How comfortable do you feel with closing a, v a venous injury primarily? A great question. As I mentioned, it took me some time to build up some confidence doing my own approaches. Uh, we have a great approach surgeon in South Florida, and I've taken upon myself anytime we did an A-lift. He, he hadn't done any obliques, but anytime we do an A-lift approach, I would treat it as a mini fellowship. I'd follow his steps, I'd do the things, and I'd learn the anatomy. And then I would go over a multitude of cadaver labs of getting further comfort level. You know, anytime we have a lateral cadaver lab, as people work on direct laterals, I just sneak in and always do the oblique approach, visualize anatomy. As I learned that, you know, getting down to that disc space, uh, respecting the vessels, um, and kind of anticipating where the vessels could be, I became more and more comfortable. And the most important thing, who should be doing the approach, right? Should I be doing the approach or the vascular surgeon? I think whoever is ready to deal with a complication should be doing the approach. And, and you think of a worst complication that can happen, which is a large vascular injury uh, and less so large arterial injury. I think that's the most devastating event that can happen. And you shouldn't approach it like, I, I wish it never happens to me and I hope it never happens to me. No, every case I start, every day I wake up and I know I have a case coming up with 5-1, I think it's today's the day I'm going to kill somebody by letting them bleed out. So I anticipate that from the beginning. That's just a general mindset, right? And I know I only started doing it when I felt that, yes, I can suture the vessel, I've learned that, I can control the vessel, I, and, you know, and there's, there's a stepwise progression of how the, ble the bleedings are dealt with. Uh, so far I've been lucky enough that all the, the, um, the venous pooling that I saw was very low volume very easy to control with just by putting a, a yank car suction while you get the um, uh, fibrillar or surgical cell snow and you start slowly packing around the vessel, slowly releasing the pressure or adding more of that uh, fibrillar material. And that would tampon that enough where I did not have to put an actual stitch on the, uh, uh, on the common iliac. But we always have a 5-0 proline with a pledget available if we have to put it together. Large vascular clips, you know, all kind of, there is a protocol that my scrub tech knows on the back table, it's all there and ready within seconds. It's a great point, but uh, an important one. I, I think uh, now that I think surgeons are becoming more comfortable with anterior approaches, you need to be able to address the complications. And I, I think that was a very good, you know, explanation of how you've became comfortable doing it. Uh, I also think it's regionalized. You know, in my institution, if if you're doing an anterior approach, you're not uh, at least having an anterior um, or general surgeon or vascular surgeon on standby. Um, it'd be a real issue. So I, I do think there's some regional implications of doing your own approaches. I, I know a lot of surgeons who do them and are very good at it, uh, but those are things that if you're gonna embark on, on doing anterior approaches, you need to really settle where, where you're practicing. And I would say, you know, I, and it's an old adage, you know, complications are like death and taxes. They're gonna occur if you do enough surgery. So you need to be able to address it. And, and it's a very good point and very good presentation, Timmer. Appreciate it. And so uh, we're gonna uh, move along and,